Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Cell-Based SPR Microscopy Applications in Drug Discovery with Pfizer. I am Michelle Ashton of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Biosensing Instruments. To learn more, visit biosensingusa.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speakers, Dr. Shiji Wu, Application Scientist, Biosensing Instruments, and Jonathan Brooks, Principal Scientist, Pfizer Pharmaceuticals. Shiji and Jonathan, you may now begin your presentations. Thanks for the introduction. My name is Shiji Wu from Biosensing Instrument. Today, I'm going to talk about the basic principles and applications of surface plasma resonance microscopy. Before we start talking about uh, SPRM, please allow me to say a couple of words about Biosensing Instrument. Biosensing Instrument is located in Arizona, USA, and we started in 2005. Uh, since 2005, uh, we have developed a series of platforms for specialty SPR measurement, particularly in 2017, we uh, developed this new tech uh, platform called SPRM, which is uh, very well recognized by the industry and received quite a few awards from different institutions. And it's also very well recognized, received a lot of interest from researchers all over the world. SPRM is a label-free technique that allow you to uh, directly counter a cell onto the uh, SPR chip surface. Therefore, you can study the uh, binding kinetics with memory proteins directly on the cell surface, close to their physiology conditions. It can provide a real-time analysis and give you the uh, binding uh, parameters, including the uh, association and the dissociation rate constant and the binding affinity. It can also be used to study some nanostructures and the nanoparticles, uh, including species like virus, bacteria, and so on. SPRM has three key components. The first component is the SPR unit. It includes the lysos, the detector, and the sensor chip. On top of this SPR unit, it is a bright-field optical microscope, which essentially illuminates the same area or looking at the same area. This optical microscope allows you to precisely position and locate the sample to where you want to do the experiment. It also allows you to monitor the status of the sample during the experiment. The last component is a uniquely designed flow system. And this uniquely designed flow system provides the uh, pre, uh, optimized flow conditions to ensure accurate SPR measurement and also allow you to directly counter the cells onto the chip surface and maintain the uh, measurement conditions during the experiment. By combining all three of the components and the system allow us to measure the uh, uh, parameters of the binding kinetics, including chi on and chi off and the binding affinity. This is how uh, optical system and the uh, a chip uh, well looks like in a real system. The um, optical uh, microscope looks uh, from the top of the uh, chip. The uh, polymer well uh, sits on top of the uh, gold chip, and the gold chip can be functionalized uh, chemically for uh, culturing of different uh, cell lines. Uh, most commonly, they will be uh, used uh, like uh, collagen, PLL and PDL, etc. After the uh, experiment done, the uh, data will be saved in a series of uh, images, including the bright field and the uh, SPRs. And then we'll divide the whole area into uh, 
number of small regions we call the region of interest. So usually it will be around like 600 up to several thousand, depending on the time you want to spend for the calculation or the compute, uh, computation. Uh, and then for each of the uh, ROI, we'll generate a sensor graph. So most of the time, the experiment is done in uh, a kinetic titration kind of uh, fashion. So which means it will go from low uh, concentration to high concentration just continuous injecting one after another. And once we have all the sensor graphs generated, and then we'll feed those data to the one-to-one uh, -one binding model. And then we'll apply the binding filter and to remove all those non-specific bindings and leave only the good specific bindings corresponding to the, uh, uh, the molecule and the uh, uh, receptors on the cell. And from those, we can get a histogram a distribution and which will give us the average uh, chi on and a chi off, and also the uh, affinity. Now I will show you a number of uh, examples for the binding measurement using uh, SPRM. So this is one of the uh, nice experiments we've done with uh, AstraZeneca. And the system we are looking at uh, is a small molecule, uh, AZ1395, targeting the uh, GPR39 receptor on uh, HEK cell. The uh, result is shown here. On the left, this is a uh, uh, SPR image, and on the right is a corresponding optical image. And the optical image, you can see more clearly where all the HEK cells are located on the ship surface. And each of the color square on the surface reflects one of the good areas gave you a good binding data. And you can see immediately the good binding data come overlaps with the uh, uh, position of the cell very well. So this tells us we are looking at the bindings happening on the cell, not on some empty areas. And with all the data uh, we uh, analyze, we can obtain the uh, isotherm from which we can obtain the uh, binding affinity um, based on the uh, thermodynamic analysis. We also have all the uh, sensor grams for each of the units area, and we can feed the kinetic model, the one-to-one -one binding kinetic model for each of the sensor gram. And from the fitting, we can obtain the, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, the value uh, the average value of the K-on and K-off, and also the uh, binding affinity. And also we see the, uh, because we are looking at uh, many different uh, areas, and we get a, a distribution histogram, which shows the uh, uh, variation uh, of the heterogeneity between the different cells or the different parts of the surface. So the results we obtained for the uh, binding affinity is about 400. Uh, nanomolar and it, the corresponding K on and K off uh, uh, reported also here. And this molecule is actually very well studied by uh, AstraZeneca and other researchers. So one of the results reported uh, in the literature using a technique called the BSI, which is the backscattering interferometer, and it gives a value about 233 nanomolar, which agrees very well with our measurement down here. This is uh, another small molecule uh, example uh, binding to the uh, membrane transporter, and uh, it's the data from uh, Casey. And in this experiment, we have done uh, positive binding and also negative control samples. And you can see for the positive experiment, we can have this uh, nice uh, binding uh, data. And for the negative, uh, essentially no bindings observed uh, in the, uh, on the cell. Now, this is actually a very interesting example. Uh, in this case, uh, we have a bivalent uh, antibody and binds to the uh, uh, BR3 cells. And this is uh, data is from uh, Genetech. And we actually have a very um, good uh, webinar with uh, Yilin Mai. And uh, his, he, she gave a very good uh, presentation. If you are interested, you can uh, go to the um, uh, webinar. And what is interesting here is we for the bivalent antibody, and we do see two binding peaks. 
Well, most of the uh, examples uh, we've been working with, uh, like uh, the hearing cells, they are usually easier to culture on the uh, chip surface. And for some of the uh, researchers, they are interested in looking at live uh, uh, suspension uh, cells. And the question is, is, can we really do suspension cells? And this example shows um, the uh, possibility that we uh, do uh, testing with uh, B cell. And it is uh, done in collaboration with uh, John from Pfizer. This actually John is an expert on this. And uh, he's going to give a very nice uh, presentation later on about his uh, results. And what is nice here is uh, we have the uh, live cell and uh, we grab it onto the chip surface and then we run the usual experiment. And what we obtain is the uh, Ka, Kd and also the affinity. And here is the uh, uh, sensor grams for uh, those uh, uh, regions of interest that shows on the uh, optical and the SPR image. This is another interesting uh, experiment uh, done by uh, Signature. The system we're looking at is just a molecule targeting the uh, ATS1 receptor, which is uh, endogenously expressed on a breast cancer cell. Again, the results is shown on the uh, top images. The middle image, which is the uh, optical image, and uh, you can see where all the cells is located. And the corresponding SPR image is shown on the right. The left side is the fluorescence image and uh, used to uh, validate or to uh, prove the uh, expression level of the ATS1 receptor on the uh, cell. The uh, analyzed data is reflected by those colored squares on the image and again, it actually overlaps with the uh, position of the cells very well. And the results will be obtained from the measurement and gives uh, uh, affinity, uh, the big KD value, about two nanomolars. Uh, this particular uh, receptor, the NTS1 receptor, this protein, actually has been purified and studied by um, Dr. Huber from uh, Roche in uh, Britain, uh, UK. And she actually used uh, conventional SPR and purified this uh, receptor and did the conventional measurement for the same molecule. And the results she reported is about uh, 400 picomolars for the binding affinity. In the literature, there's also some in vitro uh, uh, studies uh, for different type of uh, ATS1 receptors. And for the uh, wild type and human type, um, it gives uh, different values about like uh, uh, 500 picomolars and to eight uh, nanomolars. And our SPRM gives uh, data about two nanomolars, so which actually fairly agrees very well with those uh, in vitro studies. SPRM can be combined with uh, uh, other techniques like electrochemistry. So we can actually add a, a potential stat to the system, and then we can supply uh, uh, electric modulation uh, to the uh, system, and then using the uh, SPR imaging capability to uh, monitor the uh, local responses of the uh, chip surface, the materials on the chip surface to the uh, uh, electric modulation. Here are two examples for the uh, electrochemical applications with uh, SPRM. The first one is the uh, SPR-based uh, impedance uh, experiment. So what you're looking at is the um, uh, responses of uh, CH cell to the uh, apoptosis treatment. And you have the optical image, the SPR image, and the SPR-based uh, impedance image. So the SPR-based impedance image shows the localized responses of those cell to the treatment. And the second example, it shows the CV 
using a CV to study the um, uh, individual gold nanowires on the chip surface. So each of the gold nanowire and was shown up with the interference pattern on the image, and they can be labeled from here. So for each of the gold nanowires, uh, you can have a, a CV uh, based on the, uh, uh, the, the SPR signal. So you can see the depending on the size and the, uh, uh, the, the, the conductivities and those uh, different properties of the individual gold wires, and they should see differences in the CV. So which just proves those nano wires are not uniform. They uh, have different uh, physical shapes and uh, scales and the properties. Uh, thanks for uh, listening to this uh, presentation. And in summary, uh, SPRM is a very unique and label-free technique that allow you to directly do measurements on the uh, cells and to work with uh, membrane uh, proteins directly uh, without uh, extracting them from the uh, system. Uh, with this, and I will pass the time to uh, John for his uh, interesting uh, research. Thank you. Thank you, Gigi. My name is Jonathan Brooks, and I work for Pfizer in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I work in the in vitro pharmacology group, which is embedded within the inflammation and immunology research unit. Today, I'd like to talk about the kinetic characterization of ligand and antibody binding to cell surface expressed CCRL2 using surface plasmon resonance microscopy. So this is the outline for my talk today. Uh, just briefly, I'd like to go over our group here at Pfizer and uh, then move into the CCRL2 that we're gonna be talking about, uh, the biology and the ligands. And then the initial data that was formed to look at the binding of ligands to CCRL2 using flow cytometry. And then I'll get into the uh, binding kinetics uh, that I perform using first the ligand tracer, and then of course the bulk of the work using SPRM microscopy. The in vitro pharmacology group within the I, &I uh, unit here in Cambridge uh, is responsible for supporting programs uh, from discovery all the way through first in human. Uh, within my small group, we use a suite of biophysical uh, platforms to uh, help in this effort. We look at both small and large molecule targets here in the group. Um, so that keeps things interesting. You can see some of the technologies below that I use, uh, starting with uh, protein characterization and then moving on to performing binding assays using uh, traditional biosensors. On the bottom of the slide, you can see some of the technologies that we use for looking at um, cell binding. We can do um, steady state cell affinities using the Conexa and we can perform binding kinetics using uh, ligand tracer. And now most recently we can perform binding kinetics using the SPRM 200 from the biosensing. We do have a Corning Epic that we um, have used on occasion as well to look at um, um, interactions of small molecules to uh, cells. Within uh, Pfizer here in Cambridge, we do have access to uh, many uh, technology core centers uh, throughout the site, and these are valuable in helping us in our discovery efforts. Uh, you can see them listed here, flow cytometry, high content imaging, microscopy, mass spectrometry, and uh, next-gen sequencing. And uh, if we can't do things on our own, we certainly go to them with their expertise to help us uh, move programs along. So CCRL2, uh, the uh, cell surface target that we're going to be talking about today, is a non-signaling uh, GPCR. Um, it's upregulated during inflammation, uh, shown here, and uh, it what establishes itself as a chemokine gradient. And uh, as uh, CCRL2 is uh, expressed on these endothelial cells, uh, chemokines will come and bind them. And we thought that these chemokines will then act as a, a target of interest for other inflammatory cells to then bind and then potentially hopefully lead to some uh, type of a response. 
Uh, again, because CCRL2 is non-signaling, there's no downstream uh, event that we can measure when looking at this target, um, such as a phosphorylation event. Um, there are many reported ligands in the literature for uh, CCRL2. Uh, Kemerin and CCL2 are two that I'll talk about today, but you can see the others listed here. Kemerin and CCL2 are quite small compared to uh, the antibody binding in other I just wanted to uh, make a note of their uh, molecular weights uh, here. So my goal with this was to use SPRM to help better understand the biology around CCRL2 and look at the binding of these ligands. Um, to, to this uh, cell surface expressed target. The initial work looking at ligands binding to CCRL2 was performed using a high throughput flow cytometry assay shown here. Uh, as you can see, the cells were uh, plate plated into the 3D4 well plate and then uh, biotinylated ligands were added followed by secondary agents. And what you can see here in this uh, diagram is uh, binding of chemerin to CCRL2 expressed on the uh, overexpressing cells with a really nice uh, uh, binding curve and a nice CC50 manifold analog. And what you're not seeing is uh, binding by CCL2 uh, in this particular assay. Also, at the same time, uh, antibodies were evaluated for binding. You can see the um, commercial reagent here from RD Systems and the BioLegend antibody, both binding uh, CCRL2 on these cells with um, very nice EC50s and uh, no binding by the isotype control antibody. One of the first things I did when I started my work on this effort was to do a ligand tracer binding experiment. Ligand tracer uses fluorescently labeled analytes to measure on rates and off rates to cell surface target receptors. Shown here in this schematic, cells are plated onto a dish in spots. You can have your parent, you can have your overexpressing cells or your parental cells in two separate spots. Then you rotate the spots through your media containing your fluorescently labeled analyte of interest. As it analyte binds, you see an increase in fluorescence response. When you're done collecting your on-rate data, you can then remove the media containing analyte replace it with media alone and monitor the dissociation of the bound complex. So for my effort with ligand tracer, I spotted two spots with uh, CCRL2 overexpressing cells and then two spots of parental cells. These were attached on uh, collagen coated uh, areas of the dish. Then I tested chemerin uh, that I labeled with Alexa 488 at 100 nanomolar. You can see the binding uh, shown here by the thick lines, the red and the blue, to the overexpressing cells, and then the uh, thinner lines are the parentals. So we subtract that uh, the parental from the overexpressing, and you get the subtracted data shown here by the black sensograms, and then the red fit lines. So we fit this now to a one to one binding model. You can see in the table below the binding affinity, the on rate, the off rate, and the binding affinity which is very similar to that that was um, shown by the EC50 on the um, flow cytometry uh, assay. So to investigate this further, I wanted to use SPRM uh, to perform binding of a panel of uh, analytes to cells expressing CCRL2 uh, and then also the appropriate control assays uh, using the parental uh, non-expressing cells. So we coated uh, cells onto the chambers, the cell chambers using either collagen or poly-D lysine. We coated the uh, cells around 50 to 100,000 and incubated them in uh, the incubator until they were confluent um, and ready for testing. And on the day of the test, we would uh, fix the cells with PFA or we would just test them live and the running buffer was PBS with 0.1% BSA. <clears throat> Over here, you can see the samples that I tested, Chemerin in-house, and then the R&D systems CCL2, and then the three anti-CCRL2 antibodies shown here, along with isotype control antibodies.
And from an operational standpoint, we uh, ran uh, a three minute on rate, uh, th 10 minute off rate, and then the flow was 150 micrometers per minute. There was no regeneration between the samples, but we did have a 10 minute wait between each of the samples tested. And we tested three to four samples per day um, on multiple days. So when you perform an uh, SPRM experiment, the data analysis is pretty streamlined. And I just thought I'd uh, show what I did uh, to analyze the data for this particular uh, batch of samples. In the top panel here, you can see the bright field image with the green SPR overlay. That's everywhere where there's an SPR effect occurring. The area where there's no cells in the gray area, uh, there's no SPR occurring. We overlay that um, area with uh, what we call regions of interest. And so each one of these squares is a region of interest. And each one of these squares is going to generate a binding response um, that will be measured. And that's shown here in the bar response. You can see this stacked overlay of sensograms in a concentration dependent manner from low concentration to high, similar to what you'd see in a single cycle uh, kinetics binding experiment. The uh, cell-free area uh, where there's no cells uh, generates a minimal response, which is subtracted from the raw response. And then we do a buffer injection, uh, which again is uh, referenced from the uh, raw response. So double referencing the data. The data is then um, cut and stacked, uh, shown here, and then it's fit to the binding line. You can see the red fit lines of the uh, uh, binding data. Um, because there's so much data, it's uh, nice to, um, or it's easier to view it as a distribution plot because there's many um, uh, on rates and off rates that make up these uh, binding affinities that are uh, calculated into a mean value shown here. Um, in the end, the data that was used for the final analysis is shown. You can see the regions of interest that were. Uh, used for the accepted data fit. So this is the data for the uh, binding to the fixed cells. Uh, here we uh, have taken the cells and fixed them and tested the ligands for binding. Starting with Keimerin, uh in the top, you can see the ribbon diagram just to remind us all that Keimerin is not an antibody, it's a lot smaller. And you can see the regions of interest in the accepted fit here, and then the stacked uh, plots here. Then the distributions, the on rate, the off rate, and the binding affinity. Very similar to what was observed uh, both by ligand tracer and the flow cytometry. Next up is the antibodies, the RD systems 2350, 23501, and then the BioLegend antibody. And what you can see is a nice um, stacked overlay plot of the binding sensograms. Um, one thing you'll see uh, in this data is negative curves, and that's not indicative of nonspecific binding like you would traditionally would uh, think using a, uh, an, uh, a traditional biosensor. It's more um, of a response of the SPR um, on the cell and thereby generating a negative binding uh, negative response, but it's uh, actually some really nice binding data there. So it's, it's something to um, get used to when working with the SPRM system. Again, the on rate distribution, the off rate distribution, and the binding affinity for the 2350, and then the 23501, the BioLegend antibody. One thing we did um, observe when testing against fixed cells was no binding by CCL2 or the ISIS hype control antibody. And I'll show you that against the live cell data. And now we're binding to live cells. And in this plot, you can see Keimerin binding to CCRL2 on live cells. You can see the regions of interest that were used for the accepted fit in the bright field image here. And there's many of them. And then you can see the stacked uh, fit plot here good distribution of the affinity shown here, and then the on rate and the off rate distribution shown in the bottom. You can see in the SPR image some brighter areas 
uh, in the um, window, and these are indicative of very high SPR responses that are uh, in the uh, plot uh, up here. Now here, you're, I'm showing the CCL2 and the isotype control, which do not bind to the uh, uh, CCRL2 on live cells. And what you see, this is what we see when um, we don't get any bindings, just very few ROIs that end up in the uh, image. Um, th th there's really no binding going on at all here, both for the CCL2 or the isotype control. And um, we get very little data that can't be um, really anything done with it in terms of getting uh, on rates or off rates or, 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 or an affinity for that matter. Um, I will say we didn't see any binding to um, the parental cells with any of the samples that we uh, tested. This is the binding to the parental cells. I, uh, instead of showing the bright field images with the very few ROIs, I'm just showing the binding incidence here that would be on uh, binding histograms. If you look closely, you can see on the y-axis, there's very few binding events occurring here for Keymarin, uh, BioLegend, and the R&D systems antibodies, and also the isotype control. So this is what we typically see uh, when we have no non-binding events occurring on the um, cells of interest. Now we're back to a binder, antibody 2350 from R&D systems, binding to CCRL2 expressed on the live cells. You can see some really nice ROI pattern here and some um, the fit um, data here and a good um, affinity distribution of the data as well as the on and the off rate um, data as well. And antibody 23501, not as good as 2350 in this instance, but still um, measurable binding and decent binding kinetics and affinity. And then the BioLegend antibody shown here uh, generated quite large response units, um, which has made it really hard to see the actual um, fit lines uh, within the data, but still excellent binding affinity by this uh, antibody and good um, rate kinetics. So I just thought at this point, before I summarize, I'd like to show some data of chemorin binding to live cells on separate days. Because of the nature of the system of having to grow the cells on the chips uh, and prepare them for each run, you do get different cell states and different cell densities when you perform the uh, assay. And that's just shown here day one, day two, day three, each day is a different chip and each one contains a different, you know, uh, area of um, cells that were used for the uh, binding. You can see different areas within those days where the cells bound uh, to generate SPR response with chemorin. But if you do look at the data and you look at the curves, and more importantly, if you look at the binding distributions, what you can see is pretty good consistency and on rate, off rate, and binding affinity from the three separate days of chemical analysis. Um, much, um, maybe not as tight as you'd see with a recombinant protein on a traditional biosensor, but certainly very, uh, very tight for a, a live cell system looking at binding kinetics. So summarizing the data here, you can see chemorin binding to fixed and live cells on three separate days, very similar on rates, off rates, and binding affinity. And again, that holds true with the R&D systems, uh, 2350 MAB, the 23501, and then the BioLegend antibody, A302. And again, we saw no binding by CCL2 uh, to either fixed or live cells. And also we saw no binding by isotype control. And again, as I mentioned previously, we didn't see any binding of any of these analytes to the parental non-expressing cells. So in summary, um, we used the SPRM to look at various ligands for binding to both fixed and live cells expressing CCRL2.
and we were able to generate pretty robust rate kinetic values uh, for both cell states. No binding was observed by CCL2 or the ice type control antibody, and no binding was observed to parental cells not expressing CCRL2. The binding that we did generate did uh, agree well with the other labeled, and I underline that, techniques, the flow cytometry and the ligand tracer. And just um, to summarize, shows that SPRM is a powerful tool uh, for label-free analysis of ligands binding to cell surface targets and has allowed us to generate these rate constants and affinity values and help us better understand uh, the biology surrounding these cell surface targets. And with that, I'd just like to thank you for your attention and um, acknowledge a few folks before I uh, take some questions. Um, in particular, Zhenwei Su, who performed all the flow cytometry data, and if it wasn't with, for his effort, I wouldn't have been able to um, work on my end using the SPRM. I'd like to thank Joe uh, Brennan and Paul Morgan. Joe was uh, instrumental in getting this project going and uh, reached out to me to um, perform the SPRM. And lastly, I'd like to thank the folks from Biosensing, Wynn, Shiji, and Akemi for their help and support, uh, troubleshooting, and uh, and uh, allowing me to speak with you today. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Shiji and Jonathan, for your informative presentations. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Our first question is, the surface of the cell has many receptors. How does SPRM detect the binding of my specific target receptor? Okay, uh, this is she. I will take this question. So actually, in the uh, presentation, uh, there is uh, you know many uh, examples show how we deal with this. So essentially, you know you need to uh, overexpress the um, receptors you are interested, and also a good way of um, you know uh, confirm the experiment is to run negative experiments and uh, use negative controls. So by combining all those uh, you know different uh, uh, experimental designs, so you will be ensure you are actually uh, looking at the, the, the receptors you are interested in. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, John's here. Uh, John may want to add something. I believe he's reconnecting his audio, so he should be joining us back in just a moment. Um, in the meantime, um, I do have another question here for you. Okay. And the question is, what is the range of affinities that can be measured by SPRM? Uh, okay, that's an interesting yeah. question. The, uh, exactly the SPRM, so uh, even though it's, um, it's a diff different uh, detection mechanism, but the uh, uh, measurement range is uh, uh, usually in the uh, tens of picomolars to uh, micromolars. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, our next question. How did you capture the suspension cells on the chip? Uh, yeah. The the chip is that's actually one of the advantages of SPRM. So we don't have to extract the uh, 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 the memory proteins from the cell. So we um, for the uh, I mean for the suspension cells, uh, we can actually capture uh, I mean uh, capture it with uh, certain uh, functionalized uh, coatings uh, on the go surface, so including like a PLL and PDL and uh, Cell attack, and uh, it's actually uh, John is actually the first uh, uh, pioneer, uh, you know, on to uh, working with the SPRM uh, with the suspension cells. And John, you may want to add something more. Of this. 
But Charles, do you have any trouble with the audience? Can you hear me okay, Shiji? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. So we okay. are yeah. Yeah, so um, with suspension cells, it's you have to you have to test them um, with various um, attachments um, to see which ones work best. I found uh, through trial and error for particular um, suspension cells that um, you know collagen might work better for others for, for for a particular set of cells than say fibronectin or um, poly D lysine. Um, it, you just have to see how the cells look, and then sometimes you can, um, you know, it, it's also how well they'll um, adhere because under flow, uh, cells uh, have, you know, washed away on me before. So you have to find something that's going to adhere the cells but also keep them, you know, relatively happy. Okay, great. Thank you both. Okay, our next question. Um, how can you minimize the interference of optical pathway um, each other, which is SPR light and optical microscope light? Uh, well, okay, <laughs> that's a very interesting question. I think whoever asking this question is an expert. Um, yeah, we do uh, actually uh, use a custom design uh, optical path. It's actually to isolate the uh, light paths from the uh, optical illumination and from the SPR and to avoid the interference between the uh, bright field light and the uh, uh, laser or the SPR. Great, thank you. Now, does the cell, do the cells, um, let's see, does the cells be suspension cells, or can we use um, adherent cells too? Oh, you can use. Oh, you can use both adherent cells or suspension cells, but they need to be still attached to some type of a medium because the slides used in the instrument are glass. So, um, it, you know, you still have to stick them on there using some type of an attachment medium. Yeah, adhesion cells is really actually a little bit easier, like in, 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 in general term. I mean, yeah. Uh, Great, thank you both. Your next question, are cells fixed or treated in any way to immobilize them on the chips or to keep them stationary during analysis? Um, oh, sorry, Shiji. No, go ahead, go ahead. Well, <laughs> I've I've always attached the cells live because I've grown them in the incubator um, on the attachment medium, and then when they reach a certain level of um, confluency, I will remove them, and then if I'm going to test live, I'll test live. But if if I'm going to fix them, that's when I'll fix them. I'll fix them right before I perform the run. So I wouldn't attach, um, you know, cells that were. I guess modified or fixed onto a cell surface, if, if, if that's what the question is. Uh, I, I would fix them after they've grown and then perform the run. Yeah. Okay, great. Now, John, this next question is for you. Did you examine or are you aware of any small molecule, molecule binding studies via SPRM with this or other receptors? Um, I've, I've looked at small molecules binding to other cell surface targets and using SPRM microscopy uh, here at Pfizer. Uh, I have not looked at any small molecules to CCRL2, just the, the, the goal for this was to look at the antibodies and uh, chemerin. Okay, thank you. Now, this next question is a three-part question. Um, what mode of SPR detection is used? Is it more similar to SPR imagery, imaging? And is, is reflectivity being measured, angle of reflection? 
Uh, well, in uh, SCRM, actually, yeah, we do actually uh, marry the uh, reflectivity, and I use that to uh, calculate the shape in the uh, response angle. Thank you, CG. Does the gold surface work as an electrode in CB combination? Uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, uh, I mean, so if you try to combine the uh, SCRM with uh, electric chemistry, so the uh, the gold chip uh, will work as the uh, working electrode, and uh, its uh, electrochemical setup is actually very similar to the conventional uh, three electrode uh, 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 setup. So you have the reference and the counter electrode, and uh, of course they are all mini electrodes uh, because you know, they need working the uh, cell culture uh, well. Yeah. Okay, your next question: How were you able to determine if there's a one-to-one -one interaction? Um, well, the thing is, is we when we look at those bindings, is, you know, we uh, assume the uh, it's a simple one-to-one -one binding, and uh, use that model to uh, uh, to fit the data, and then based on that uh, fittings, and uh, we eliminate those uh, uh, those uh, sensor graphs which doesn't fit very well or give a lot uh, deviates a lot from the one-to-one -one binding, and um, you know, there is always uh, some uh, some people uh, asking like a complicated fitting, and uh, you can accommodate like a complicated uh, mathematical models, uh, or you know, or kinetic models, but then the uh, error involves the fitting uh, will uh, increase as well. So for the um, for the for the experiment we are doing for the analysis we are doing, so we essentially uh, fit the data to the one to one uh, binding model. Great, thank you. What is the difficulty of implementing and method development for SBRM when compared to Sativa T200 system? Uh, I can say a couple of words. I, I think John may <laughs> has lots of experience on it too. And uh, okay. I mean, basically, this is two different. Uh, we are looking at the two different systems. I mean, they are all SPR, of course, um, but. Uh, the major difference is, you know, the uh, the T200 is a conventional SPR, so mm -hmm. you need to extract the, uh, uh, the, the the sample, the protein or the receptor proteins uh, from the cell, and then uniformly, you know, prepare the chip surface. And uh, I think the major difficulty for that is extracting how to purify the uh, proteins from the cell. And uh, in the SPRM, so we basically overcome that uh, step. Uh, and we directly culture the cell onto the uh, chip surface and work with the uh, receptors in the native uh, cell surface. So, John, you want to elaborate that? <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's it's much different than a um, you know an uh, uh, an SPR a traditional SPR system because you're dealing with live cells and you have to culture the cells on the chip. Um, and then set up the, the binding. Like a um, traditional biosensor, you have to be aware of your buffers to, that, that um, in this case, might impact the cells. Um, so you, you have to be careful with what buffer system you use. You don't want to damage the cell because in, in this instance, you know, my cells were live, so you don't want to... Um, um, you know, use something very harsh, like a very high percentage of DMSO or something like that. Um, also, um, the, it, it, this also comes into throughput. You you can't, like a traditional biosensor, run hundreds of samples at a time because of uh, the, the, the live nature of the cells. You can operate within a window of, you know, so many hours uh, where you think your cells will be most viable before they might uh, start to, you know, um, go off. And that's something to be aware of also when, when um, performing assay development using the system. Okay, great, thank you. Jonathan, this one's for you. How did the small molecules evaluated against other cell surface receptors perform via SPRM in terms of uh, 
data robustness, consistency with expected kinetics, affinities, et cetera. With some of the experience I've had using um, small molecules, performing small molecule binding using SPRM, I've actually had some very nice data um, with a panel, a small panel of small molecules that I looked at with a range of um, binding affinities that were um, um, generated first using a biochemical assay. And my data from the SPRM tracked quite nicely with the um, with that data. Um, so that that was very, um, very, very nice. But also I would say um, you have to be careful with small molecules. They can if they're if they're um, if they're um, you know promiscuous, I would say, and, and, and could bind to other things. You have to have a control cell uh, available to make sure you're not just looking at something that's non-specific. So ideally, for every small molecule or any protein protein experiment I do, I'd like to have a, a negative control um, cell something that's a non-expressor, and also have a, a negative control uh, compound or uh, protein uh, as well. Okay, great. Uh, can you go into the details of how we can interpret the negative curves? Uh, well, the negative curves that you see on the, um, on the SPRM are, you know, there. If if you if you've ever run a uh, biosensor experiment using a um, an octet, uh, octet uh, generates negative curves as well. And um, you know, the, the, their software you can flip the curves so they become positive, and then you fit the data as you would. In this instance, you just have to get used to looking at curves that are um, negative. The, the negative curve is really an SPR phenomenon. It's not necessarily a uh, binding phenomenon. I've had curves that look almost um, identical um, that are uh, negative and positive, and, and it's just it's the same data, but it's just um, it's just expressed on the um, you know from the um, software and, and from the SPR effect negatively. So um, you just get used to it uh, in this instance. Okay. Uh, uh, well, actually, um, yeah, I think that this is uh, uh, there's um, uh, there's some you know uh, uh, fundamental differences. I mean, kind of uh, how we actually do the measurement with the SPRM uh, with the live cell. So uh, you know, in here, you know, we, there's uh, research papers you know published. So in here, when we are looking at you know the uh, when you have the binding of the cell surface. And the binding really caused some like uh, physical properties changes to the cell, including like a stiffness and the morphology changes, and all those parameters kind of transfer to the uh, SPR uh, signal uh, responses we are looking at. So that uh, depends on the how the cells responses to the binding. Sometimes you know we do can see an, a, you know, a negative curve instead of. Uh, uh, a positive increase in the signal, like most of the people see uh, in a conventional SPR. But those, uh, uh, those curves, uh, the sensorgram, even though it's a negative response, it still perfectly uh, reflects the uh, uh, kinetic process, the binding process. So that's what I want to add. <laughs> Thank you, Shiji. We have time for a few more questions here. Can we optimize the surface area according to our cell number? Um, I, I could take that a little. Um, you, you have to have a minimum number of cells to be able to generate a, a robust SPR response. You don't want to have too few cells. And that's, again, that comes with assay development. When you're um, growing the cells on the surface, you want to have uh, enough cells that that you'll be able to get a good enough response um, at, uh, to binding to your target, and um, and, and um, you don't want to have um, you know too too many, and then you don't have any referencing. Uh, you don't want to have too many cells. So it's it's uh, 
it's something that needs to be optimized. And it's, of course, receptor dependent. If you have an overexpressing cell line, you might be able to get away with fewer cells than you would with, say, a, um, a native cell that has a, a fewer uh, uh, level of receptors on the surface of the cells. Okay, great. Thank you. Your next question, SBR instruments offer a tremendous throughput, often testing hundreds of recombinant purified proteins in less than 24 hours. What is the SPRM throughput? Uh, John, you want to comment on that? <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, you have to... Um, take into account what type of target you're looking at, and again, the expression level of the target. For, for the work I did with these PCRL2 antibodies, I was using an overexpressed cell line, and I felt comfortable you know, testing three to four antibodies uh, per run, knowing that um, these were fairly high affinity and that there was probably gonna be some antibodies still bound when I came through for the next uh, antibody binding, but I knew there would be the excess uh, receptors available um, for binding, and, and that and, uh, that played out when I did the uh, analysis. So it's it's that's certainly not as high as you would get with a, a traditional biosensor. It, the system is automated. It has a uh, you know a great uh, user interface. It's 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 it is just set up your plate, load everything, start the run, and walk away. So you could conceivably do, I would think, depending on, you know, if it was a small molecule or if you were just screening a single concentration or, or maybe, you know, a high and a low concentration, you could probably do tens of twenties of samples um, if, if, if things were really well optimized. Um, I've probably run at any one given time, the, low, the highest number of samples I've run is maybe five. Um, and, and again, that it, it, it takes a while because there are you know many washes and things like that, just like a traditional biosensor. But um, you're certainly not going to get the throughput you would with um, compared to a traditional biosensor. That being said, I would say it's much faster than other cell-based systems such as ligand tracer, which you know you need to label each of your analytes for that. This is label-free. There's no labeling required. Yeah, I mean, bottom line, uh, I mean, the SPRM is not designed for like a fast screening technique. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you both. We've got time for one last question here. What is the running buffer used in SPRM? Are analytes diluted in this buffer? Is it a growth media? Well, I guess that depends on the experiment, the cell line you are using. So in general, uh, I mean, the system itself doesn't really have a, you know, a limitation and on it. And you can use pretty much every kind of general uh, uh, buffer system. And it depends on the cell line, depends on the experiment, and for live cells, and uh, you may want to use the, uh, some buffers to uh, keep the cell, you know, uh, happy for as long as possible. Uh, yeah, uh, John. Yeah, I agree. It depends on the system. Um, um, if they're fixed cells, you can just use a, a standard PBS buffer with um, BSA um, for for the binding. It, it, that's what I've used with fixed. But for live cells, you might want to switch it up and. Um, try to do something that's going to keep some the cells uh, happier. This really comes down to method development at that point. All right. Well, thank you both, Shiji and Jonathan, for your time today. Do either of you have any final comments for our audience before we close? Uh, I well, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I just see a lot of questions on here. I'm sorry we couldn't answer them all. I could try offline, I guess. Yeah, I think uh, happy to uh, you know have everyone here, and I will definitely try to get all the answers back to everyone. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, you know after the, uh, the the presentation, I mean the the webinar, and uh, you can always contact us.
Yes, and as a reminder, any questions that we didn't have time for today and questions that are submitted during the on-demand period, um, they will be addressed by our, our speakers via the contact information that you provided at the time of registration. So again, we, we'd like to thank our speakers. We'd also like to thank Biosensing Instruments for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand. Lab Roots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thank you, everyone. Until next time.